we're back now. An online talk from uh, Victor Rohot. Oh, oh, I forgot, Victor, the last time you were here, how to pronounce your name. I'm very sorry about that. Rethinking Material Agency, Bioelectricity as a Model of Causation for the Life Science. You have the floor, Victor. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I hope that the technical people this will appear. Uh, so yeah, so as, uh, I, first of all, I wanted to thank you, Alexon, for making it possible for me to present uh, this wonderful workshop with, without, yeah, even though I wasn't able to actually come to uh, Blue now. Uh, so I'm really excited to talk to you about this. And this is, uh, so, I want to begin by a little bit of context about this work because this is a joint work very much in progress that we began with David and Murta uh, back in 2021 at the Diverse Intelligence Summer Institute and the project that we started there grew uh, beyond, the, the, beyond, the, uh, beyond the summer school and, and we have continued with that. And the overall aim of that project is actually to start rethinking materialism uh, as it is uh, appearing in philosophy, especially in philosophy of mind, uh, but also in philosophy of biology. And the point that we're trying to make in this project is that there are insights nowadays from empirical sciences such as condensed and active matter physics, basal cognition, and soft robotics, which very much reshape uh, how matter is understood in, in the sciences that philosophy supposedly draws on where, where we're talking about materialism. And in fact, we think that the material, the, the notion of matter and the notions of materialism in philosophy have been lagging behind those changes in the empirical sciences. Uh, so there's a couple of points. The, the, the biggest point that we see uh, are the following three. So first of all, condensed and active matter physics uh, has, has provided a bunch of studies which indicate that there is an inherent activity or perhaps even goal-directedness in simple non-biological material systems. And here I like to quote, for example, the studies that Martin Hutchins did with uh, oil droplets that he had that, that, that were able to show uh, to solve uh, mazes. So he actually got oil droplets to navigate mazes. Uh, another example uh, it comes from the basal cognition, so the research on very basic forms of cognitive like behaviors in organisms which are in a single cell bond and also very simple uh, multicellular organisms which where we actually uh, observe complex activities which which we would term cognitive if they were exhibited by more standard organisms. And here an example is, uh, is uh, comes from uh, the work that is being done on the uh, sign mold. Uh, I can't remember the, I forgot to change the Latin name, but a unicellular slime mold, uh, also known as the blob. It's, it's uh, for example, in the Paris Zoo. And one of the most famous experiments that have uh, that have shown what kind of cognition like abilities this kind of system has has uh, had the had the slime mold solve the Tokyo map uh, problem where the the, the, the slime mold was able to create optimal connections between different food sources uh, finding the optimal solution to the Tokyo map uh, the Tokyo the Tokyo subway map uh, problem finally. Uh, soft robotics, especially in the domain of morphological computation, has been showing how non-standard substrates can be increasingly used in an engineering way for information processing. And we believe this kind of also shifts the way we should be thinking about information processing in uh, biological and cognitive life systems or cognitive systems uh, in, in this sense. Uh, so yes, yeah, so this, uh, this is the overall plan for my talk today. Uh, I want to I want to begin uh, especially after the, the, the previous talk because I will touch upon some some similar topics as a kind of ascendant this stuff with. Uh, but I want to I, I would preface this with saying that I do not have very uh, metaphysical views. What I want to achieve with this talk is to show how uh, research in biology, empirical research in biology, shows that biological causation is a very messy, very weird process and that our philosophical notions uh, have to catch up with this kind of uh, empirical evidence that comes through. So to kind of um, draw a baseline of, of those philosophical notions that uh, it can be a little bit strong maybe, but I hope not too much. Uh, I'm going to introduce the just physics view um, and reductive materialism. 
standard redacted materialism as a baseline for, for our approach. Then I will move forward to uh, the main example that I will be throwing up on uh, in the remainder of the talk, mainly the example of bioelectricity uh, in the uh, developmental and regenerative morphogenesis. And then I will point out those two weird uh, issues that appear in this kind of system. So first, uh, downward causation, and more specifically, like circular causation, so the interplay between down downward and bottom-up uh, causation. Uh, then I will say a little bit about non-local causes, and I, I will explain more what I mean by that. And then I will try to draw this together in my this emerging picture that we claim uh, comes from this kind of research. So, um, okay. So to begin with, uh, this kind of like the basic view that we we think is still kind of it, it's still very much present in philosophy, especially in philosophy of mind work, thinking about. Uh, reduction is this kind of just physics view, and it's embedded in the standard passive view of mechanism, as Jessica Risk has uh, uh, argued in, in, in her great, great uh, book, uh, The Restless Talk, where she shows that there have been actually multiple notions of mechanisms, but our current views are embedded in this passive view, uh, where entities in the physical world are seen as uh, exactly passive, precisely. And, and not able to uh, to perform any action on their own, they have to make be made to move. And this reductive materialism can be stated in this in this form. So uh, in this thing is that all of biology could be in principle, whether we as limited, uh, whether our human limited cognitive resources allow us that or not is a different issue. But in principle, biology could be explained in terms of particle physics. So the fundamental particles, whatever they are, and their interactions, and that there's nothing else uh, that that is actually there in physics. And this is uh, something of, of somewhat like positivist ideal, I would say, and uh, and it has been actually widely criticized. That I, that's why I say this is perhaps a little bit so many, uh, but I hope not too much. And I will say a little bit about those criticisms in a second. But also, uh, uh, it is still very much present that here I, 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 I won't quote Samir or Kasha on the sentiment that there is perhaps a sense in which the developmental explanation is more causally fundamental, for it is an explanation from the bottom up. And the developmental explanation, where he is discussing the earlier sober distinction between developmental and selectional explanations and the causality that comes from those types of explanations. And he's precisely saying that this kind of like bottom up, simpler things explaining more complex things uh, and causing more complex things. So, when we explain the processes that are more complex, we have to actually explain the causality of this lower, simpler level that makes this higher level up. And he claims that there is something more fundamental about this kind of relationships. And this is so, so I think, even though. There has been criticism. This sentiment is still present in uh, in, in different forms. And um, as I said, it, those criticisms come from two main points. Uh, I would say, and uh, Green and Butterman here have done a great work by uh, showing that this act, this ideal is not in fact applied even in physics. So in biology, we usually claim that this is like. Uh, yes, we should explain biology this way because that's how the physics works. But Green and Butterman, drawing on condensed uh, matter physics specifically, uh, argue that in physics, maybe not in particle physics, but in many other areas of physics, this idea of null is not meant. We have multi scale modeling where both bottom up and top down relationships come into play. And uh, this is also visible in this kind of like uh, active matter physics system. So, what they uh, put, they put this picture into the uh, into the claim that there is something like the tyranny of scales, uh, uh, and this claim says that there is a difference in how physics operates at different sites and temporal scales. So when we uh, when we uh, when we are thinking about causation specifically, but in general physical processes operating on the medium scale that we are most accustomed to where our conscious lives happen, so to say. Uh, the, the kind of physical relationships that, that we observe here are going to be distinct from the physical relationships that are that we can observe on a much lower scale level. 
and this lower skin level is already there at the so, so the cellular level the process is happening within cells are already at the smaller level where uh, this kind of our middle scale physics doesn't actually apply that well or doesn't transfer easily uh, directly from those two different scales. So um, to kind of substitute this point a little bit, I want to quote uh, a lengthy, uh, uh, yeah, I want to, uh, to, to put this a little bit lengthy quote from Godfrey Smith because I think it captures this idea of how the trillion scales quite nice. And we're talking about the seven cells and the behavior, the physical operations happening on the level of cells. He says, in that context and at that scale, matter behaves differently from how it behaves elsewhere. In a phrase due to Peter Hoffman, what we find is a molecular storm. There is an ending spontaneous motion that does not need to be powered by anything external. Larger molecules rearrange themselves spontaneously and vibrate, and everything is bombarded by water molecules. Electrical charge also plays a immediate to scroll. Through ions dissolved in the uh, water and charged regions of larger molecules. The wind is by biasing tendencies to dissolve imagine random walks in useful directions. So towards the end of the code here, we're going to reverse this kind of like different thinking and modernization that we have to have in mind when we are uh, looking at the, cell, uh, at, at the cellular scale. But I want to focus a little bit uh, on, the, on the earlier part of the description, especially, for example, on, the, uh, on this being bombarded by water molecules. So our standard experience of water is that when we move through water, perhaps it it is a little bit more difficult than moving through the air. We feel that the, the water is more viscous uh, than air, so obviously it's going to be putting out more resistance when we move through it, but, it, but it's okay. Uh, we can still do that. However, when you're looking at the level of the molecules that are within cells, what we have to realize is that water molecules are quite large on that scale. So uh, they, they have so, 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 so smaller, smaller molecules parts of proteins and other molecules that are uh, crucial uh, crucial for the operation of cells just by being immersed in this kind of water environment it, it's actually they they, they, uh, they experience so to say so they are met with uh, completely different forces than we usually associate with water so 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 so, uh, so this kind of environment is very different from our middle scale experience, what we usually think about. This is on the middle, middle scale, it doesn't translate that one. Okay, so um, moving on, I want to say a little bit about bioelectricity, because one of the things that Dr. Smith points out in his description is the role of, bio of electrical charge of, the, of cells. And this has, in fact, been um, so there has been a lot of controversy surrounding the research on bioelectricity that dates back to the 19th century, the work of Calvani that I have uh, included in the, in the title slide. Uh, and people have been, have been uh, in, some, in some parts, very, uh, that, that's been accurately a little bit, um, uh, how, how do you say that? Uh, to be a little bit conscious of the risks that come with this work, uh, and, and in result, we had this kind of like uh, dominance of biochemistry throughout the uh, throughout the 20th century, and this dominance had been kind of uh, I think that one of the reasons that this dominance of biochemistry of gen genetics has been in part because of this reductive uh, ideal of explanation, because it, it translates very well to this reductive ideal. So we were, we've been very much trying to explain everything in terms of genetics uh, throughout the 20th century. However, this bioelectrical research has continued, and in recent years, it started to bring, bring about more and more evidence that perhaps not every biological process can be explained through uh, genetics, and not that not that genes are not all all there is to explain biological processes. And uh, at the forefront of this research has been the uh, lab at uh, Tufts University, led by Michael Levin. And I want to uh, refer to a particular experiment very, uh, I think, it, it, because it very well uh, pictures this kind of relationship that bioelectricity allows us to have. Um, so they have, they have conducted a set of experiments on planaria, little worms that are a couple of millimeters long. 
uh, Planaria are a very interesting system because they have astounding regenerative capabilities. So basically, you can slice them into very thin slices, many thin slices, and each slice will regenerate the full form after some time. So, uh, and this is actually the main way they reproduce. I, I think they have some ability to sexually reproduce, but mostly they reproduce just by being injured. So whenever the worm is injured and split into two worms, <coughs> regenerate and the two worms continue living. Uh, so they have this very weird uh, lifestyle uh, because of that. But they, uh, it also makes them a great system to study uh, the developmental and regenerative morphogenesis, so the processes of, uh, of, of, of uh, Organisms to actually that organisms use to achieve a particular shape, and um, one of the studies that uh, uh, Levinov has conducted was to slice uh, those worms into three parts, and they kept the middle parts to just the front without the head and the tail because normally they have a, a head and the tail, of them. and that's yeah they got this simple as you, as you can see on this picture. Uh, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but mm -hmm. here uh, perhaps. Well, let's place a point there now. Uh, so here you have the head, here you have the tail, and they had this little uh, this, uh, this, this asymmetrical structure uh, in this way. Okay. Uh, so what they did was slice them into three, use just the middle part, the trunk, and they then embedded it in a bunch of chemicals for a short period of time. Uh, that had influenced the expression of iron channels in the cells. And by that, they modified the bioelectrical pattern, uh, so the pattern of communication between cells. They removed them from chemicals and placed them in the normal environment, so just in water, because they live in water. And what happened through this editing, they were able to induce a non standard morphology of this organism uh, without any genetic or any other surgical changes. They were able to grow a two-headed worm, and in other experiments, they have been even able to grow four-headed worms. So it's kind of like cross-shaped like worms, which have uh, also the size of the trunk, additional heads. Uh, so very weird morphologies, which are not usually observed in nature, uh, and perhaps even not at all observed in nature. But this is only part of it, because what happens? So once you have this two-headed worm, you can actually slice it again three parts, keep just the middle part, just the trunk, and place it again in plain water without any further manipulation. So you, you, you do manipulate the bioelectrical pattern at the first step, but you don't change the genetic makeup. You don't change anything else. And then at the second uh, division, it actually regenerates to uh, heads again. And this continues, this kind of process continues uh, over multiple so the same generations of uh, of this kind of uh, yeah surgical procedure uh, where you just cut them and make the trunk regenerate and it, without any further um, uh, intervention, it, sh it, it is able to regenerate to heads consistently. So what it shows is that there is a, this kind of this bioelectrical pattern has a great role that it plays in. Uh, in um, morphogenesis, uh, regenerative morphogenesis in this case. And uh, as, I, I, as I try to underscore, this happens without any kind of genetic um, modification in the organism. Okay, so I hope that this is more or less clear. So I, I will now move on to the. Um, what kind of consequences I think are drawn from this for the picture of biological organization? So the first uh, consequence is that this exhibits uh, the complex interplay between top-down and bottom-up causality that is at play in morphogenesis and perhaps in biology more general. Because in terms of top-down, we have this uh, pattern, the biological pattern that determines the actions of individual cells. And this is this pattern, as it's shown, and here I can draw again on what Kayla was discussing. So we have intervention on the level of that pattern. So we have this kind of higher level intervention, and we can observe particular results. So uh, if, if we apply this kind of 
defense systems of the Gazali, we, we still uh, should conclude from that that we actually have this kind of higher level of organization influencing what happens at the lower level. It influences how the cells uh, divide and how the cells uh, 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 choose particular type of the cell that it will uh, that they will be like of this organism uh, because of the difference between the head and the tail. Um, so yes, we have this kind of top-down process, but, uh, process, but at the same time we have also a bottom-up process because this bioelectrical pattern depends on the bioelectrical activity of individual cells, obviously. It depends on uh, what kind of signals, what kind of ions they, uh, they, they send out, uh, and it, this in turn depends on this kind of on what kind of ion channels they have. Uh, so um, I, I would take this to mean that there is not just bottom up and not just top down, but rather there is this kind of like mutually uh, codependent relationships between the lower level and the higher level of organization in this uh, in this uh, in this case. And I want to refer also here to the uh, argument uh, by Dennis Noble from his twenty twelve paper, where he's been claiming that in fact this kind of bidirectional result is pretty about uh, biological systems, and he, uh, he he shows that with this diagram, where in the middle we have the standard view of bottom up causation from genes to proteins, cells, all the way up to organisms, and uh, this, this this standard view. But at the same time, he recognizes that there are top down influences which which skip level or go from a level to another level and influence the behavior of the of the lower levels in making. Being at that time costly efficacious. Uh, so, so, yeah, so he claims that this kind of top down and bottom up interplay is more uh, present throughout biological systems. And uh, as, as, um, as King has, uh, has, has also mentioned at the end of this talk, uh, both the top down causation is metaphysically weird, and people have been trying to avoid uh, accepting its existence. Uh, however, there have been multiple attempts of, of providing a way to naturalize uh, this kind of top-down accusation. Uh, and one, uh, and I think very much well applicable in this case, uh, way of doing that comes from the notion of through the notion of constraints that had been, I think, originally advanced in this context by Paul Emesh and his co-authors uh, in this famous paper. Uh, but I also want to draw on uh, Turbo Deacon's uh, arguments in that regard. So constraints are um, the kind of, for example, we can think of constraints as uh, the initial conditions, but also the boundary conditions of a particular uh, system by a particular process. And they have the two, uh, two functions. Uh, so first of all, they restrict state-space trajectories. Uh, so they uh, make the system they reduce a way that uh, how many uh, how many trajectories in the in the state space the system can uh, take because they make some of them unlikely or, or impossible uh, at all. But at the same time, they have this enabling of productive function because by restricting the state space, they enable particular trajectories which otherwise could have been unlikely uh, uh, and make the system uh, bias the system basically towards them. And here we can know the relation between constraints and physical work that he controls. And his example comes from combustion, so we can think of an engine. Uh, so we know what happened in an engine is that we have basically the uh, gasoline or uh, any or other fuel explode. And this explosion, if it happens in an unrestricted space, it would just explode and dissipate. However, when it happens in a uh, restricted space of an engine, uh, this explosion is able to power the process just because the, 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 there are constraints on how the energy is being released, and this uh, can transfer the energy in this whole world. And again, this goes back to this, to, to the description that um, that uh, borrowed from Godfrey Smith, where we see again that this thinking about constraints seems to be because of this uh, how constraints can bias the system towards particular. Uh, state-based trajectories that it seems to be well suited for this uh, level of uh, cells. Okay, and 
we can draw that into a more complex view where we, can, where we think about this bidirectional causality in terms of mutual constraining relations. Uh, and this shows us that scales, uh, temporal or, and size scales, are not causally insulated. And the activities of one scale can and do impact activities from other scales, but need not determine. So this, there is this very complex interplay of how much causality comes from which level. Uh, and uh, and this, uh, this statement about mutually constrained relations allow us to, to capture that. And for, from that, we can draw some arguments towards strong dimensions, but I, I'm not an expert in that. I, I'm not sure how much I agree with David in this regard. So, for we'll, full we'll treatment, you will have to wait for his uh, doctoral thesis, actually, where, where, where he's uh, putting a full treatment of this in, in relation to emergence. Uh, and I want to use the remainder of my time to turn to a uh, slightly different uh, to, to the second weird bit that I think comes out of the picture of causality in the biological system. And uh, I, I have termed it uh, non local causes uh, because I, I don't want to argue for any kind of a physical action at a distance. Uh, so I don't think it's that strong. However, I think there is this kind of level of. Uh, of interplay between mediation and direct impact of particular events which are uh, which are uh, disconnected in terms of space and uh, perhaps even of scale or, or temporally disconnected biological systems that makes us uh, <coughs> forces us to consider this kind of non-locality in a weaker sense um, and one thing is uh, is that and this can be seen in this kind of uh, bioelectrical uh, example that I can uh, show you before. There is the difficulty of tracking, tracking causal relationships, especially with photogenesis. We don't know what impacts what. And the one example uh, is, is in the case of downward causation and this bidirectional relation between downward and bottom up causation. Uh, however, even on a, on a single scale, there is still the difficulty of tracking which cell influences which because we have this kind of like very complex picture where everything seems to be influencing everything else and in this kind of like very strongly connected network, uh, this, uh, it's difficult to track individual events and see how they, um, how they, uh, how they are causally efficacious. And, um, one of the things that I think it, it makes it visible is this kind of a stop problem, or what I call the stop problem. So one of the biggest difficulties for any view of morphogenesis is the question of how does uh, how does the process know when to stop? So how individual what is the source of information for individual cells uh, for, for them to know that the target shape of the organism has been achieved, and this happens both in, in the regenerative case that I've been discussing here, but also in more standard developmental or standard uh, regenerative cases where, uh, where where we have this kind of like target anatomy that the organism is trying to achieve. Uh, but how does it know that it has actually achieved that? Because no, no, no individual cell can have access to that type of information. So this is a very difficult problem uh, for, for biology and, and, and so not well understood how that happened. Uh, but in philosophical terms, it could be said that there is this kind of, again, uh, metaphysically weakly, and I'm saying this word without putting too much metaphysical emphasis on them, but uh, just pointing out the difficulties that appear. Uh, perhaps there is some kind of a causal power of access this book here, or perhaps even Aristotelian final causes and teleology comes into play at this level, uh, or what we <coughs> call the ultimate position. And uh, so yeah, so so so, uh, but it's 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 very difficult to see what causes this uh, this process of stopping. So this this is why I decided as an example of this difficulty of tracking causal relationships. Um, and and this kind of complex and very interconnected process is actually crucial for biology, as uh, some people would like Mike Lennon argue. Uh, and Lennon has advanced his Victor, in biological individuality. Victor, could you conclude? You're out yeah. of time. Okay. Okay, so I have, uh, okay, so I just want to, I hope that I have two minutes more, so maybe I just, yeah. Uh, 
So I would just conclude with this idea that uh, the coordination uh, is a prerequisite of individuality, so this kind of interaction is what enables the alternative to transfer from this level of individual cells into a, a level of the, of the multicellular organs that are acting as a biological individual. And there is a bunch of uh, problems that are related to this. And I will skip, uh, skip the conclusion, perhaps, because it's not also very, it's, as I said, it's a work in progress, so uh, I'm more interested in, uh, in, in pointing out difficulties now. I don't have too many solutions at this point. Uh, and I want to thank my co-authors. Questions, comments? Yes. Thank you. Are, are you able to hear me? Uh, if you could speak a little bit louder, because the audio well, the, is a little bit choppy. The microphone's the microphone stuck to the wall, so if you go get closer to the wall, that's the issue. All right. Um, yeah, I, I can hear Charles better. Yeah, I'm, I'm in the front of the room. <laughs> is it, it, yeah. Can you hear me if I stand here? Yeah, that's perfect. Okay, thank you very much for your talk. Um, so we've been talking, I mean, obviously in this, workshop we're talking a lot about causation and so I'm interested to know um, it, uh, to invite you to say more about um, interlevel causation especially thinking about the, the noble diagram um, and you raise the really interesting example of this mutual constraining relationship and how that's one suggestion for how to make interlevel causation go through um, but I'm wondering if there is an issue there where we ought to separate relationships of constraint or explanations by constraint from explanations by causation. Um, so for instance, the kinds of modal constraints that might be applied by the available uh, state spaces, um, are, um, are those causal explanations or should we think of those um, in the way that say that, you know, uh, like Mark Lang would call them, uh, sort of, um, right, uh, modal or mathematical sort of constraints that aren't causally efficacious. And so when you've got this sort of synchronic dependence between these two levels, um, and one level is impacting the other, the other level by constraining the, the, the trajectory, the, the possible trajectories in the state space, it, are we warranted in thinking of that as a causal relationship? That's that's my question for the noble diagram. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for the discussion. I I, uh, um, I I want to say that it's uh, it, it is causally efficacious, and now I I'll, I'll, I'll try to explain uh, my thinking behind it. It's it's not a full argument uh, yet, uh, but uh, so. So uh, drawing on the kind of interventionist uh, view uh, for, for status, uh, it, I would say that exactly this case of bioelectricity shows us, and the specific, the specific experiment that I've been drawing on shows us that when we impact the level, the higher level of directly, um, because, because again, we manage the whole organism or the part of the organism not individual cells, so we cannot modify the bioelectrical communication of the level of individual cells. We modify the bioelectrical pattern as a whole. Uh, we don't have we don't have the tools yet to impact the individual cells in this uh, in this procedure. Uh, so, so I think this warrants uh, saying that there is this kind of causal relationship from this higher level of the pattern of activity towards the activities at the lower level, specifically how uh, how the uh, how the individual cells divide and how they, uh, they how they choose the particular type of cell that they develop into in the course of the process. So uh, I think there is this kind of link there. Uh, obviously uh, obviously uh, you could argue that uh, that it is just this mathematical constraint or this kind of maybe structural constraint because it is a little bit of that as, uh, because how this bioelectrical pattern offers the kind of a kind of a topological maybe uh, or a structural uh, recipe of sorts for the organism 
so you can try to argue that this is uh, this is rather than and try to avoid assigning any kind of causal efficacy to that. Uh, but I, I think that there is a lot more purchase just in terms of empirical uh, progress that can be made with the stronger view. Other questions, comments? No, but it's just, uh, Victor, I, I, I like your point that this reduction does not work in physics and the literature in philosophy of physics and in physics showing that it's obvious that there's no reduction in physics is gigantic. It's just, you uh -huh. know, there's surely something to, there's surely a problem of communication between physics and the other fields for the other fields to believe that something could be reducible to physics. Uh, and I have to say that I appreciate the fact that you discussed it at the beginning, but you could have filled your slides of, of reference, <laughs> all saying physics itself does not reduce to physics. Uh, on the other hand, I have, as a comment, not a question, as a comment, it's probably the fact that philosopher of physics write really poorly and most of the time refuse to discuss to, with any philosopher of science outside physics <laughs> that it's not known. You know, there's a, the, the hot subjects in physics now is effective theory, which is by definition modelization that cannot be reducible. So, yeah, and I, I think that another trajectory in this, in this problem is that we have been uh, Inheriting a lot of uh, a lot of things about this uh, through philosophy of mind, and it has been embedded in particular discourse of physics or, or philosophy of physics from the 70s and perhaps even from before that. And philosophy of biology has been kind of like too much connected to this kind of thinking to be able to to, care, to, to step aside and to look at the broader field, especially as you say that uh, it's difficult. It, it's it's not like I can read. Physical literature. I can read some of the basic cognition literature, and some of the people there uh, are smart enough to, to read physics, and uh, so, so I have still this kind of disconnected. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. Daniel? Yeah. This is perhaps on a similar kind of comment. Uh, there's also a lot of historical literature on this. Um, and I would be careful about using that book by Jessica Riskin to make these kinds of claims you're making because. Oh, sorry, sorry, I can pause for the mic. Yeah. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of historical literature on this, especially on on uh, the material reductions in question, and I would caution you against using Jessica Riskin as your historical source for this. Okay. Um, I would suggest looking at one of the classics, which is called in Good Fields, The Architecture of Matter, um, which presents, I think, a more nuanced picture of the history of this, despite the fact that it's a, it was like published in 68. Um, and I'm going to do the thing where I plug a paper that I wrote um, <laughs> in which uh, you could read me as saying, possibly, that there are cases where physics reduces to biology. Um, uh, but you'll have to make your own judgment on that. Okay. Um, okay, so, so I, I, I have actually, I have been believed uh, risky part on this. Uh, but as we did, it's a very well written book and very convincing uh, when you read it. But, but I'm thankful for that for the uh, Yeah. So we are out of time. Thank you very much, Victor.